Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kian, and I am from What is Design, a collective of design students discovering design. From a student's perspective, we share about the value of design in today's context, and we, enc we encourage youth to participate in Singapore's design movement. Um, I'm Kian, and I will be your event MC and moderator for today. Thank you for taking time to join us this uh, webinar today, Local Design Board Games, the first of the What is Design series of talks. Our topic today is on board games and gamification, from creating one in the midst of a pandemic, to leveraging in gamification methods, to anticipating possible problems when you want to put this into practice. The session today is presented in collaboration with National Vending Gallery and Design Singapore Council with the support of National Design Centre. This event is also part of the National Design Centre's program lineup in August and September with a thematic focus on Singapore, our home. And before we proceed, I would just like to highlight a few housekeeping rules. Should you encounter any technical issues, please feel free to reach out to our technical team through the Zoom chat function. We ask for your patience and understanding should conditions be less than perfect. During this webinar, your audio will be on mute. However, we welcome your questions throughout the presentation um, via the Zoom Q&A function. So when you pose a question, please remember to first state your name and company. And also, if you have a specific panelist whom you would like to respond to your question, do indicate so as well. Finally, please be informed that this session will be recorded. Now, please allow me to introduce the panel and this morning's program. First, we have Yasmin Kader, co-founder of Bye Bye Virus, a card game that aims to bring some cheer to people stuck at home and teach them how they can protect themselves against viruses. Yasmin will be sharing a video presentation on how designers start their ideation process. Next, we will have Zio Lai, co-founder of Capital Games Studio and Mercat Games. Zio has published award-winning edutainment board games, which have won the highest accolades in International Series Play Awards. He will be sharing a video presentation on how to recognize the value in a card game idea and when to move on from project failures. Last, but definitely not the least, Lillian Lee, founder and creator of Say What, a fun card game to learn languages while playing. She will be sharing a video presentation on when and how to use gamification in solving problems. Lillian has background in advertising, design, and user experience. She believes strongly that gamification on learning or any skills learning is important. We will then be wrapping up things with a live Q&A session with all of our presenters. So please feel free to post your questions throughout the presentation via the Q&A module. Also, poll questions will also be appearing on your screen after each video presentation to further guide our discussion. So please participate and let us know your thoughts. Without further ado, I will now present to you Yasmin Kater and the Ling Slim's presentation that explores how designers start their ideation process. It will be an insight into the ideation journey. Hey you and welcome to five lessons from creating game. My name is Yasmin and I'm one of the co-founders of the awesome game called Bye Bye Virus. So before we dive in, I want to share with you why people don't start making games and oftentimes it's because there's a fear of failure of what's going to happen when I go ahead and create anything. It's not only applied for games, it applies for just about anything when people don't start doing things. Or we use excuses like, I don't have enough experience, or I don't know where to start. And the reality is that when I look at any creative endeavor, I look at it as an opportunity, as a journey, and I want to have a lot of fun in it. And then I also look in terms of not having enough experience as, well, if I don't have enough experience right now, how do I get more experience? And maybe I can ask some people who know a bit more to help me along the way. And that's why please don't be afraid to ask for help because most of the time people will help you. It's really incredible. I'm going to share with you examples of how people helped us in developing this game. And if you don't know where to start, I think it's a really silly reason people say is because we live in an era where there's Google. And Google has just about anything. We developed a game with no experience, Googling just about everything from the thinking process and so forth. And of course, the second time I make a game will be better, but 
it was a good starting point, and then from there, we just keep on evolving. So a bit about me is I started an entre my entrepreneurial journey as a teenager, and not because I had that entrepreneurial streak in me. It was because my father lost his job, and for three years, he was unemployed, and my family was using family savings. So the environment was a little bit stressful. So my mom really said, if you want something, you have to go figure it out. So I started creating lots of things. I sold paintings, I made jewelry, all kinds of things so I could make sure that I had the funds I needed to do the things I wanted to do. And most of the time, those those sales were helping me get more learning and more teaching in the, in the creative world. So what I ended up working in my career, I ended up at the very beginning starting in the oil and gas sector. And um, my father, unfortunately, had passed away from cancer. So I got certified as a coach, and at one point I was generating more revenue from my side business than my real business, which made me realize that I would rather do much more meaningful work in this world than to go ahead and to, to work in an environment that not inspire me. So since then, I ended up going ahead and training thousands of entrepreneurs to become more effective at selling themselves. And at one point in this journey, I ended up launching a production agency, even though I had no experience making videos, and took it from zero to a million dollars within 18 months. And now what I focus my attention on completely is the sales story method where I train leaders, entrepreneurs, on how to go ahead and sell through many of my different programs. So when COVID hit, you can imagine a training business that predominantly was offline was severely hit. So I ended up going in through my Google Drive and really finding this game that I had developed four years ago. I had developed, designed, everything was ready, but I was so scared to put it into the market. And within 10 days when COVID hit, I launched the game. Uh, I made a small order. I made an order of 200 decks and I printed it in Singapore in Bras Basa. So all very local. Um, and I realized, wow, like when I got customers giving me feedback, how much I loved it. And it really opened up more opportunity of what can be done as a different tool for education. So during this time as well, Denise and I ended up brainstorming a bunch of things that we could do in case my business would tank basically because of what was happening with COVID. Um, so we ended up writing a roadmap of how to make a million dollars in all these side hustles to be able to help us along the way. And we were really naive obviously, because making a product does not take a month. Somehow we thought it would just be boom, a month when we already have our own jobs or businesses. So something that we learned as a mistake. But from that, we ended up picking one game and then boom, this is one of our prototype versions of the virus. We printed it during Circuit Breaker and it was on really shitty paper. We printed two different colors and one of the colors, you couldn't even read the text, it was so bad. So you might be wondering why a virus game? Well, it's pretty simple. We looked around us and everyone was talking about COVID and we said, why not? It's a, it's a good time to make a, make a game and a virus game would be a cool idea. But since then, I've actually identified like seven or eight different games that I want to develop. And I think it's once you start with what's something that you care about, what's something you're passionate about, you discover more opportunity. And that's the reason why I think the Singapore dream is so successful is because it's making fun of the fact that we're always talking about the Singapore dreams. And we never had a way to describe it and they, they put it in a way that's just beautiful. So for us, we're like, okay, if everyone's talking about a virus, how can we make it in a way that it's, it's contextually very, very there? And initially our target was to go ahead and develop it for kids. So we try to make it quite educational. And then we discovered during one of our prototype nights that actually when adults play the game, it becomes a drinking game because adults can make anything into a drinking game. But the lesson that I want to start off with you is the first thing I learned making a virus was this. The first version is really shit. And we ended up taking paper and cutting it up. We didn't even think to buy like a flashcard. We just bought this and did that. And it would scribble on. But what happened is it just gets better. And that's why my mantra for anything that I do, anything creative that I do as any project, I always think that this is a shitty first draft. And it literally is in my head. And right now, Bye Bye Virus is on the 73rd shitty first draft. And it's a draft that I'm really proud of, but then I let go of that attachment to that it is going to fail, it's going to be horrible, because it's just an evolution. And 
one of the things that we did, obviously, it was test. We tested not only in terms of um, the game, but the game dynamics. We tested also in terms of why are cards rectangular? Why are they not square? And then we discovered it's hard to actually shuffle them. So we discovered a lot of things around it, which was really, really, really crucial. And as we got along the journey, guess what? The ideas evolved and they got better and our shitty first draft got nicer and nicer. I even got to the level where I was like, I don't want to make, I want to make sure that our characters are both female and men uh, equal as well as people who, don't just, they're not just people who don't identify to either gender. So it was just like thinking about it and evolving the thinking to make it so inclusive because of what was happening and what was the, the conversation around Black Lives Matter. I'm like, oh my gosh, we, we don't think about these things, but I want to make sure that we are thinking about not only race, but also gender as well. And along the way, we made a ton of mistakes. And that's why I love the mistakes. The mistakes are all lessons of learning. Like one of our biggest mistakes is you should always develop a game with a name in mind. And then you develop everything else after that. So it's all under like that message. But what happened was we ended up developing the game and discovering at the very end, like actually what are we going to call this thing? Um, so we ended up starting off by listing out the worst ideas ever from uh, kill Corona to Coronita or you're dead, like so silly ideas. But from that list, we got a list that we liked more. Um, and then from there, we picked not only the name Bye Bye Virus, but we also found the name of our next game, which was gonna be coming out next year called Free the Grannies. Now along the way, one of the things that we learned was that Maybe it was lockdown, maybe it was circuit breaker, but we were saying yes a lot more. Um, and to give you an example, one of the things we decided because a friend inspired me to do this, is like, if you put it on Kickstarter, like how are you gonna cover the cost of the game? And we're like, oh yeah, it's true. But we had no experience with Kickstarter, so we had to make a video. And after trying and getting frustrated by the fact that we were stuck in these four different walls, what happened was uh, we started making a rap song and it wasn't that bad. And then we got it a bit better. And I was working on getting AR, VR filters for our uh, Instagram and Facebook for our characters. And then we decided, and our, our video became a mixture of both, which was, to be honest, quite terrible, but quite fun that we went ahead and was able to do that. And the fifth lesson that I learned is that the reason why we were able to launch a game in 10 weeks is because a, we're a tiny bit insane, but B, is because we asked for lots of help. When we were doing the rap video, a friend of us, a friend of ours knew someone who's a rapper called Masha One, who actually has written lyrics for Jennifer Lopez. And then uh, my friend's boyfriend is an educational specialist, specialist so I, I can, like, basically consulted him to knowing about instructional design and learning about that and even his sister Janice. And this is only three out of the dozens and dozens of people that we ask for help. So in case you're looking at doing something, please ask for help. You might know a senior, you might know a friend, you might know a teacher, you might know anybody who can go ahead and do those things and help you. And because of that help, one of our friends, Chian and Asif, who are in PR, helped us draft the press release and, and, and taught us how to go ahead and pitch to press. And from there, we got featured on the Straight Times on a whole full page. Uh, which was fantastic. But not only that, we were also like trending on Straight Times upside for a couple of days, which is so amazing. So it's just incredible from that shitty yellow paper, we were able to create this, this game. This is actually one of the, the test prints that we had. But not only that, uh, as part of the process as well, we were very inspired about helping more families. And obviously we have the clients who buy our games, but what about people who can't afford it? Uh, and as a result of that, we were able to apply for foundational grants and now distributing over a thousand decks to at-risk families and going to be impacting 4,000 lives, all because of that one silly day in February where we went ahead and started thinking about this crazy idea. Now, it is an incredible journey, but it's also a really scary journey, as I mentioned earlier on. And on Friday, we actually received all... Um, our decks, and imagine paying somebody over $10,000 and never having seen the product and just having to trust that it's gonna be okay after hearing some quite horror stories. But 
we did our due diligence. We reached out to people who had worked with this factory and we just hoped that was the best. So you can imagine when we finally opened it and the cards were perfect, how much joy that was. And actually, I cried a lot when it came on Friday because I was like, I can't believe it's finally here. And all these people are going to actually get it as well. So with regards to our journey so far, we've been able to conceptualize it within a week. We went ahead and developed a MVP within two to four weeks. We went ahead and tested and iterated for five for like two weeks as well. We went ahead and launched the campaign and took us about eight weeks to print and fulfill. And now we're in the focus phase moving forward on distribution and partnerships. So we're very lucky. Uh, we're starting this game right now on Lazada. You can buy it by Vibrex on Lazada. Uh, also the National Design Center, they have a vending machine. You can buy it as well as well as Indiegogo. And we're looking to be into more shops, more environments, more communities where they actually, people are promoting games because that's the next chapter that we have to deal with. And there are all things that we had no experience on, but that we were doing and we evaluating and going ahead. And from letting go of that fear to trying, we were able within like four weeks of launching, you know, we made a rap video, we had haters on our ads on Facebook, we generated within five weeks over $27, which is kind of mind blowing considering the fact that we were always learning these things. Thank you, Yasmin and Denise, for your insight into how we can translate game ideas into reality. We hope that presentation gives you a rough idea of how to commercialize and kickstart your own game project. Let's take about half a minute here to hear from the audience. A poll should now be appearing on your screens with the question, when attempting something new, which of these thoughts bother you the most? Let us know what you feel hinders you at the start of an ideation process. Okay, we see the results coming in. Right, so it seems like the most popular choice is insufficient experience. And you know, sometimes you think that we're so new at this and you know, there's always someone that's better than us, right? So, you know, it's important as part of our lives to learn from our failures and you know, constantly challenge ourselves so that we can grow and learn. Next, we will now be sharing Zero Lies presentation where he will share more on the ways to recognize failures during game design process and how we can move on from there. Hi, good day. My name is Zio and I'm the co-founder for Tablet Game Studio. So we have published uh, board games uh, in Singapore such as uh, Dabzilla, Cryptocurrency and Mongomania. And we have distributed all these games around the world in US, Europe and different parts of Asia. And we have won some awards, uh, particularly for Cryptocurrency and Dabzilla. So uh, today I'd like to share with you a bit uh, about why do board games fail. So over the years as a publisher, we have talked to many game designers who couldn't get their board games uh, create into a, a form and bring it to the market. So why do they fail? Let's uh, discuss uh, more about that. So firstly, the question is, is it bad mechanics design? Uh, in a way, partly so. If it's a bad, bad mechanics that basically breaks the game or makes the game uh, unplayable, of course, I don't think you can sell the game. Uh, you probably dump that out way before you want to publish the game. But however, what if uh, for some people, they feel that bad mechanics is like not creating new innovative mechanics or copying your mechanics uh, for somebody. Is it necessarily bad when you try to duplicate uh, some mechanics from other people? Uh, I would say that uh, yes and no. Uh, you, you, when you try to uh, borrow some mechanics from people, you try to create some innovation yourself. And I would say that one of the good examples that I have here is Cards Against Humanity over here. Uh, what did Cards Against Humanity do? So they basically uh, duplicated most of the mechanics from apples to apples. Okay, apples to apples has a similar format whereby you have a question and you put in answers and you vote for the thing mechanics. However, it's a much a more of a family-based game whereby the question and answers are not much more family-friendly, where Cards Against Humanity is uh, much more edgy and goes against the norm. But for some reason, I guess uh, people prefer satire over more family fun. Uh, Cards Against Humanity uh, sells very well, also thanks to their very good marketing, and they actually did better than apples to apples. Okay, then the other thing is lousy artwork and team. So some, some designers feel that you know you need to have great artwork uh, in order to attract people to buy your game. Uh, that is somewhat true, but then again, let's look at the cards against humanity as an example. If you look at the artwork, uh, that is literally no artwork, it's just words, text, simple fonts, and just blank uh, background. Whereas, look at on the right side, you have Citadel, uh, which is one of, so one of the very famous games with 
beautiful artwork that probably costs a few hundred USD uh, for a single illustration. So the thing here is that Cards Against Humanity does better in a mass market, while Citadel does better in a gamer market. So what do mass consumer uh, prefer? So they maybe prefer more edgy, more jokes, while Citadel they prefer better gameplays and prefer better art. So at the end of the day, whatever that you create, the important thing is to create a game that the market wants, okay, and not what you want. Okay, the problem with a lot of game designers is that when they design a game, of course it's design a the dream game that they want and often they play among their friends which typically have the same uh, kind of uh, likes. However, whatever you like may not be what the market wants. So importantly is to bring the prototype out to the market and that that's to let them see what they want and what kind of artwork do they want when they look at this game. Okay, the next thing is of course execution, execution, execution. Uh, just now I mentioned that uh, a lot of the board game designers, their ideas died in their dream. So they have an idea, they threw it out, but they didn't execute. So the most important thing in a board game project to make it successful is to take action, ex execute, and to keep on executing. Okay, so there's three forms of execution. The first one is product execution, where you where you uh, design a product, you do prototype testing, you create a prototype, you test with your friends, you test with strangers, you test until that you nobody can have any bad comments about you, and then you're ready for the next stage, which is operational execution. This is the part where you find someone to try to manufacture your 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 game, try to find artists to draw out your dream, your the, the kind of team that you want, and of course uh, get the goods over to the different countries, in this case, try to ship to Singapore and where do you store it, how do you sell it, how do you deliver it to your distributor, how do you deliver it to customer. Okay, so all uh, these things are fine details that uh, many game designers do not really take care of until the, the shit hits the wall and when you have a bad uh, customer experience, this is the part where a lot of people have bad experience with. Lastly is the marketing execution. Uh, when you have a game, you cannot just leave it on the shelf, okay? So a lot of the distributors, when they talk to us, they are telling us that, as you, you know, a lot of game designers, when <clears throat> after they design a game, they pass a game to us, and they just think that you're fly off the shelf. It doesn't work this way. You need to have a lot of marketing support behind, whether you're running events, <coughs> you're running conventions, you go on the media to talk about games, all this is part of the process of selling the game and help the distributor. So once a distributor hears that you are actually helping them actively market the game, they are also more willing to help you take your game on board. So uh, what are some of the things that we have done so far? Actually, uh, you, you see what Capital Games has done. We actually go out there, we go to different media around the world, talk to them to get them to uh, feature our game, talk about the game, and whether it's on Facebook, on the newspapers, or on a blog or some well, cryptocurrency. The last one is interesting. Uh, it's actually a cryptocurrency uh, portal that uh, talks about cryptocurrency. They talk about the top five cryptocurrency games you, you should try. And of course, ours is uh, quite highly recommended over here. So the thing here is that you need to go out there and talk and tell people about your game. Your game doesn't just sell on its own. So the next thing is, of course, sales and marketing. Uh, important sales and marketing. Okay, so when do you persist? Uh, in the game. So uh, there are some designers asking me, you know, Zio, I've been working on this game for a couple of years. I can't seem to get it correct. Should I continue or should I just scrap the idea and just start on with uh, work on other, other ideas? So uh, I would just like to share a, a, a story uh, from Sabotier, this game called Sabotier. Uh, the, the designer actually had quite a challenge when first trying to market this game to a publisher. So what happened was that he approached more than 12 publishers and most of the, of course, all these 12 publishers rejected him. Uh, reasons for rejection, too boring, mechanics too similar to another game, or uh, the game is too simple. So by the 12 times, you know, most people will be discouraged, but for him, he approached the 13th publisher and this is a German publisher called Amigo. And what happened after that was, you know, he didn't have overnight success. I mean, the story didn't end that way. The game sold okay, but one year later, it was being dumped at five euros at warehouse. Uh, so they thought, that's it, the game is dead. But however, what happens next was the game later picked up later and it became one of the most popular games around the world. So the thing here is that the story is that board games takes time to build the attraction, takes time to spread the word. So you need to let it have time, okay? So you cannot just hope that you'll become an overnight success like some of the board game projects because they have been designed by famous designers or what. Uh, as a newcomer, you expect to spend a lot of time and effort to promote your game. So when do you stop? Okay, sometimes you need to stop because things such as financial affect you, 
creating a blockchain is a very expensive venture. There's always a joke in the industry saying that uh, the best way to one, make one million dollars from board games is to throw one million into it. Okay, so that is the that's how you make money. So when you aren't ab unable to, uh, when you have problem with your daily expenses, please stop and take a step back, save up again, and then come back in and relaunch again. Okay, mentor. So sometimes creating a board game uh, is very stressful, whether it's an art or it's operational problem, you know, a factory screw up the thing, you become very stressed, uh, or sometimes you just cannot get a breakthrough. What do you do? Okay, same thing, take a step back and, and talk to people and see how you can best way that you can go on. And lastly, it's life priorities. Of course, things like health is important. Uh, things like maybe you have a new, a new, just got married, have a new baby, or maybe you, your parents just fall sick. Okay, these are important aspects. You shouldn't neglect them because uh, there's a saying that health is wealth and wealth is board games. So remember, one of the important things to create a board game is, of course, you need mola or money. So you have no wealth and you have no health, no wealth, and no board games. Okay, so that's, that's how I have to say it. Okay, so what do you do when you encounter setbacks? Okay, uh, you have to first determine which phase are you stuck in, where and who can you help find to help to identify the problems, and do you need additional resource, where do you find the resource? Okay, so one of the biggest uh, resource trove out there is this uh, site called Board Games Geek. It's basically like a Wikipedia of board games. Almost every board games in the world is on Board Games Geek, and it has a huge forum and community made of designers, publishers, and producers that can give you, uh, they are very, very free to share whatever they know with you if you do ask. And of course, you have Stonemaier Games. They design uh, very famous games such as Wingspan and uh, Sai. And the founder has a very big blog that talks about his design process, his marketing, and his distribution process. So check that out, these two sites out, and I'm sure that you will get some inspiration from uh, these two sites. Okay, so I think that's about the end of the thing. So how do you become a successful board game designer? Okay, the most important thing I'll say to new designers especially is to play more board games. Uh, I find a lot of game designers, they play games that are dated or that is no, no longer popular. The mechanics of the team is no longer popular. They are not playing the latest game that are being launched. So if you want to be a fashion designer, you need to you know, look at the latest uh, design that's being launched. If you want to design a board game that appears to do this crowd, you need to start playing board games that have been recently launched. And of course, research a challenge. There have been a lot of board games around there in the world with stories behind where the founders, publisher, how they succeed. Look out for the stories and I'm sure you can find out something. Thank you, Zhu, for your insight into how we can evaluate the value of a card game design. So we hope that this video gives you a rough idea of how to access when to take on a game idea and to develop it further. Let's take some time again here to hear from the audience. A poll should now be appearing on your screens with the question, what is success to you? How do you define a successful, well-designed game? We'll also take about 30 seconds. Okay, we have votes coming in. Keep going. Let's have a look at the results. So it seems that most of us, actually about half of us, see success as being able to see families having fun playing with it. Okay, so if you have any questions for Zio as well, remember to leave it in the Q&A module. Um, in our next segment, we can look forward to learning how to apply game mechanics to successfully enhance engagement in our everyday activities and learning. So last but not least, we will now share Lillian's presentation, where she shares her thoughts on when and how to use gamification. Hello everyone, my name is Lillian Lee and I'm the founder and creator of Say What. And everyone must be thinking, what is Say What about? Okay, Say What is created based on the lack, you know, and the resources of learning Chinese dialects or any other languages, you know, in a fun manner. So we came up with this idea, why not make learning fun? And why not we make learning languages or local culture in a fun manner so that people can embrace it easily without being it to be much more of a like, you know, so-called educational in the classroom or you need to read to understand about certain things you want to learn. So in the beginning, when we started it, we did a lot of user tests and tested out on friends and also like family and people who's interested in learning languages. And what happened is like, um, we started with uh, ideal human-centered design. And from there, the brief, we came up with what we can do for the community and it was a passion project from the beginning. And when we did that, 
I never ever expect it to be like, you know, uh, being a product that can sell well in retail outlets and also online. And in the beginning when we started, it was just a small little booth in MAAD Design that is on Red Dot Design Museum, which is just a stall. But after that, when we got to more retailers, then we realized, hmm, maybe you can expand it more to more like shops and also like, you know, bookstores. And from there, it's like thinking like, can we expand it out of Singapore itself? So a little bit back to the history, uh, how we created it. We created, we started out with actually um, Cantonese card games. And from there, uh, we started with uh, Hokkien. After these two cards that is Cantonese and Hokkien, um, we got a, an audience from the crowd who is someone from uh, overseas asked like, how about Singlish? Ta-da, we did Singlish itself. Yeah, <laughs> and Singlish is quite good with uh, uh, a lot of like tourists and people trying to understand what Singaporeans are speaking like, you know, is that English or is that some kind of dialect? Singlish card game. And from Singlish card games, of course, we did not uh, stop there. We went to uh, create more cards, you know, for people to learn language. And we realized like Mandarin or Chinese is actually considered the most toughest one. So we did something like, you know, what if someone who doesn't speak Chinese, who doesn't understand Chinese culture, nothing at all, how do we make them to learn Chinese, but in a fun manner? And we created a lot of kind of like tones that is easily being embraced for someone who doesn't understand Chinese. So plus we created Mandarin, Mandarin card games. And from Mandarin, uh, people are asking like, hey, sometimes I love to go to JB or I to go to Indonesia, but is there a simple phrase I can speak? Even Bahasa Indonesia and Bahasa Melayu, there are something that is similar, but at least like, you know, if you get the gist out of it, you will understand. So we created Bahasa Melayu card games. And this is actually a, quite a, a good product that is doing very well in Malaysia for people who visit Malaysia and wanted to learn simple phrases. And of course, uh, we created also um, Japanese card game. Okay. And Korean card game, you know, which I work with uh, Seong Seng Ni, if it is a, a Korean teacher. Yeah. So the uniqueness of these three cards is actually Japanese, Korean, and Mandarin. Is actually um, I collaborated with illustrators, and also like you know we're thinking like you know how do we like bring these illustrators out of just Singapore, you know, and by like you know if anyone who orders this in US or in UK, at least they know that who who is this you know unique illustrator. I want to find out more about it, or maybe there's collaboration you know across the country and the world. Now, uh, go straight to what is important for today. We'll talk about like learning through gamification and why is it so important. Imagine every one of you, you went through school. Can you tell me one thing? Is studying in school the most fun thing that you ever had? And like, you know, you're telling your parents like, you know, hey, I want to do homework. I want to go to school today. I want to like, you know, sit in the class from morning to afternoon, listening to all the subjects, you know? Unless you're really a bookworm or a nerd, you might like it. But other than that, mm, I just felt that, you know, learning, you know, is not the most fun thing. You just need to learn because you need to pass and get grades and continue your life and find a good job. But what happened if they make learning through gamification? Like, imagine when you're at home playing board games, you do learn about Monopoly, about like how to conquer certain kind of like, you know, property, certain landmark. But that is learning. But you've feel it like it's an education that you need to sit down to understand about the economics. But there's a way of business like, you know, how, how you know, sometimes luck, you know, how I get through certain place, which is the best location to buy. That is about learning, but how do you make it into game? And also computer games as well. Like, do you realize that uh, it is known as a lot of these uh, pilots or people who need a quick reaction, they will hire people who is very good reflex and most of them are gamers. So think about it, you know. So if you manage to find someone who's very reactive, gamification and everything, so I guess like the thought process is totally different, right, you know. So gamification, at the end of the day, I felt it's important. Whether it will be like, you know, 5%, 10% or 100%. And imagining learning something that you don't feel that like you're really reading through the books and like doing tests, but more of like, you know, playing level one, two game, uh, level three, level four, level five. Same as like board games as well. Like, there are always like, you know, rules that, you know, you can play this, but whether there's a never ending kind of game or the game with a 
you know, finite kind of like, you know, rules of who will win. But at least you know that what you always want to do is be the winner. No one wants to be a loser in, in the game. So gamification, uh, at the end of the day, uh, I truly, truly encourage it. And why, you know, for chorus, like, you know, even learning a skill, like, you know, uh, through apps, you know, or better learning, like, you know, how to use a fintech app or banking app, like, you know, Payla or DBS or like any other banks. There's always this thing called onboarding, you know, that you need to learn that have a, some kind of sort of elements of gamification too. And imagining uh, recently uh, there's an app on, uh, you know, SP app is on electricity. It's like every day in the check-in, you know, to read about tips like how to save electricity. And, you know, you just need to follow it and you get like, you know, points for it. And you can see, you know, with the points, your particular seedling will grow, you know, from a seed to seedling to a plant, you know. And that is actually an element of gamification. And also thinking about like, you know, some are apps about for fitness where people go exercise. It's like, you know, if you manage to, you know, cover up, you know, your target, you know, uh, steps, which is one uh, 10,000, and you actually get like, you know, vouchers or either like, you know, kind of like, you know, um, can win a, like, you know, airplane ticket, you know, or can win like, you know, supermarket, like, you know, the whole year grocery. That is gamification, but it makes it more fun. Like, you know, what is the push factor? And also like, you know, like imagine that if you want to learn about gardening, if there's something like, you know, a game that you can do on your mobile and on through life, so like capturing or each of the plant that you have, like, you know, the journey of like, you know, week by week, you know, and from there, maybe you get like vouchers from like uh, local nurseries to buy like soil or anything. That is gamification. So at the end of the day, I just want to say that, you know, gamification is always on the good side rather than on the bad side. And of course, you don't want to be someone who is like, you know, 24 or 7 on your like computer playing games. But try to make daily life a more fun manner, you know, in, in learning things. And last but not least, um, I always live by these two kind of like sense of like mantra, which is what if and why not? What if is actually um, the thought of behind like, you know, what if you can do something like this? What if my cards can expand it to US? What if, if we design more of a different kind of product other than just playing cards for people to learn language? So imagine what if is always open a big possibility for people to learn more and why not is the kind of mentality is like, you know, you never subject yourself to like things like this is done like A to B to C, but you know, why not like, you know, is there other other ways to try to do something, you know, and with that kind of mentality, what if and why not, it opens to bigger possibility and being a person who is a creative and a creator, this is super important because it doesn't stop you from being stagnant and it doesn't stop you from being like, you know, stuck into a, a, a place where you felt that this is the rule of how we do create something or we invent something and I'm going to follow it, a, a formula that's been done before. So being adventurous, you know, taking risks, you know, that actually encompasses into what if and why not. And after that, all of this, I just hope that um, everyone is being inspired. If not, Try to be inspired to create at least a product. Yeah, it might not be the kind of game-changing product like you know, uh, COVID nineteen vaccine, but at least something you know that someone can find useful. And also, like if it has gamification element, that will be great. All right, all the best. All right, thank you, Lillian, for your insight into using a card game to improve our learning. I really like that you mentioned what if and why not. We hope that um, this video will give you a rough idea of when and how to use gamification in solving problems. We all know the drill by now, so once again, a poll should now appear on your screens with the question, which of these instances do you think that gamification could play the biggest role? Which of the listed everyday tasks do you feel could benefit most from gamification? Let us know your thoughts. All right, so by far, it seems like most of us picked, 22 of us, in fact, picked all of the above. <laughs> so I, I, I suppose we'll see more card games coming out. <laughs> all right, so we're now moving into the last segment of the day, which is the Q&A sec uh, section. So if you have not typed your questions in the Q&A module, so 
please do remember to just type. We are taking note of um, all the questions that are coming through right now. All right, and joining us on screen right now would be Yasmin, Denise, Zero, and Lillian. All right. Real okay. people on the screen that are recording. <laughs> I'm so excited by this. Hi. Well, thank you all for your insightful presentations. Um, we do have a couple of questions coming in right now. To our panelists, there is this question asking, what's the difference between gains and gamification? Uh, gamification is basically uh, you have an existing education system and then you add game-like things into it like points or rewards. Whereas a game or what we call game-based learning is whereby you design with the learning in mind where the mechanics and the team has been designed to learn. So uh, in game, you play the game to learn. In gamification, you get encouraged to learn because of the game. So that's the difference. Yeah. So and, Lydia, to yeah, add, yeah, and to add on to that as well, like sometimes games have no learning. If yeah. you think about when we're kids and we play like uh, in the streets or we play with the rocks, like sometimes we just play because we're playing. Mm -hmm. And that's why games also exist. Um, so not every game you have to learn uh, and not, and that's why gamification is really cool is because like it helps you learn faster. And I'm a psychologist by background. So it's just like what, it's, what they found, if you put like studies with kids that are gamified and kids who just have to like learn through learning, the problem is that most learners are not all, they all, all learn the same. Like for example, I don't learn by reading. I'm dyslexic. So I look at that, I'm just like, oh my gosh, this is like really stressful. But somebody else who likes reading would learn perfectly. But when you gamify, you're helping uh, people who are kinesthetic, like movement-based, people who are visual learners, auditory learners, combine them together so you make a much more holistic experience and when i learned how to learn visually i went from a b student to an a student and it's not because I'm, i was a bad student I, just, I never learned how to learn for me and most of the time we learn because somebody who's smart decided this is the way we should all learn yeah it's quite true and and also it's like you know how you put in context like love and loving is different one is a very big uh, topic subject another one is the process of being it or making it so if you were to ask me like gamify so you know um, there's a lot of things like if i'm not sure whether you all realize like even when you all heard about the app for hpb like you know how they encourage singaporeans to lose weight but instead of telling people hey if you lose weight you know uh you know you'll be healthy you see so but what happened is like <laughs> if you study about the human behavior in singapore what do people like they like uh discount they like vouchers they like free stuff you see <laughs> all these kind of things you know that is the carrot dangling. So because of that, you know, the app ha has become quite successful for people like, you know, insurance company wanted to combine, you know, uh, airline ticket like SIA, SQ giving free ticket, you know, during like two years ago and people like getting um, NTUC vouchers, you know. So that actually making a very mundane or may maybe very boring kind of like situation to make it much more interesting where there's always a rewarding system. I guess when we grew up as a child also um, for a Chinese uh, family, it's always like, if you do your homework, we give you $5, you know, if you like help us to, you know, buy something, we give you $2. So everything that is a uh, monetary in exchange, that is like a TV petition to us. All right. We have another question also open to the floor. How did the internet and social media change the way people engage with physical board games? And, and as an add on to that question, and how will COVID-19 further change that dynamic? Okay, I can answer about the social media because what happened is like, uh, uh, we realized like uh, a lot of things that uh, how our games become um, famous in international like US or like, you know, in, in the Europe is because of collaboration with uh, YouTubers who is like, you know, uh, language learners and also like gamers. So once every time when they talk about it in a very honest review, because they never receive any monetary from us and they never get anything like, you know, we are trying to help them to promote. They say that, hey, I like your stuff. You know, I came to Singapore, bought it. You know, I want to feature you. You know, are you okay? So we said, okay, why not? You know, and we can chat more about it. And we realized like uh, a lot of times in, in this time, we cannot uh, depend on like, you know, words of mouth or just like, you know, putting it in the retail and hopefully that someone will buy it or discover your website. A lot of things to do with uh, social media, like hashtags, you know, uh, how to know what time to post it, you know, for people to find out. And, you know, the 
kind of like tribe community when people, example, if they follow hashtag like board game geeks or board game, you know, from there, all this will pop up the algorithm onto your Instagram, onto your Facebook, you know, and including like, you know, when you search yourself, I realized that, you know, um, because we did a lot of like uh, research on Google AdWords and Google, um, we realized that every time when we look for same with friends, is the first one that comes pops up. So because maybe it's like, you know, back end we have been searching too much or maybe other people looking at it. So organically, it went up rather than paying for it. So at the end, uh, my conclusion is um, collaboration with another game game designer or either like, you know, uh, influencer or either someone who reviews stuff and also up the game of social media, up the game of marketing. Um, I think we could take the question on how he has changed game mechanics. Um, because ours was developed during COVID, um, we actually developed the game um, to be able to play it on Zoom. So if each person has a deck um, physically, um, we actually uh, have two colors of the deck, green and blue. So you know, imagine you're playing it via Zoom with your friends. You have a separate set of instructions uh, and a separate setup to be able to play it. So I'm not sure about all the other games that have been developed, but ours was developed like specifically because of this constraint of not being able to you know, meet up in groups and play. Uh, our game is also, you know, you can play between two and six people. So we also develop it for small group settings. So as I say, can't answer for everybody else, but mm. specifically because we developed it during COVID, we have to take these constraints into consideration because so many people were like, how do we play it when, you know, I can't meet my friends, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the audience members actually asked if you could please share some good advice for local PR and marketing. How do you actually reach out to the reporters effectively? Um, so I don't do PR. I do, I do trainings around how to become better as a communicator in general. So what we ended up doing, Denise and I, our biggest mantra is we don't know everything. We don't know actually most of the things, but we will know somebody who knows something. And that's what's actually more important. So for us, what we ended up doing is reaching out first to our friends to give us tips. And then, Denise, do you want to share the rest of it? Um, so specifically for PR, uh, so we had friends who were in the PR industry. So they basically helped look through our, our press release. So they were like, what you need to do is to come up with a press release. We asked them how to look through it. And because we, were, we are both sales and business development people, we actually went to the sales route where we, we found a list of a thousand uh, media contacts uh, globally and in Singapore. Like with Singapore, you can go to the Straits Times, you know, you can look at the specific forums and you can get their email addresses, right? So we took a thousand emails, we put it into a sales system where it automates emails and just sends out all the press releases uh, to these people. Uh, and we have responses if they reply or not. So we, we, we started this campaign um, to reach out to as many people as possible, but that was actually not how we got our feature on Straits Times. Uh, that was actually through, through a personal contact. Um, so basically, we, we both have been on the news before and we just reach out to people who have uh, wrote about us before, just pitching this idea. Uh, we also pitch different media, media angles. So we went and said, okay, let, do we do the education element? Do we do the charity element? Do we do the virus element? So we had different angles as well. And we pitched it to different uh, reporters and we, we got picked up by one of them. So we did yeah. the work for them basically. So the, the key thing as well to realize is that like when we were asking our friends for help, they said, okay, let's look at where you want to be featured. And I'm like, and I was very clear, straight times. It's the biggest and I want the biggest. And also in Singapore to realize if you get picked up by a smaller media, like the Malay or the Chinese one, then straight times cannot cover you. So you need to be aware that if you're going after the small people first, you're never going to get picked up by straight time. It's like they have a, a rule in, 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 this, in this world. And we didn't know that. So we're like, oh, that's the rule. And then we know where we're going. But also, for example, with the straight time, you got to think about it. We're not actually a business thing. So it doesn't make sense for us to be there during the week. But the Sunday times, the Sunday times is the, the feel good, the inspirational stories. So we were going after people who were taking care of the Sunday times. And most games will be under the Sunday times. So if you don't even have any contacts, if you go through Sunday times, they have the emails there. So just buy a Sunday time, invest that $1 and just email them and email people who have written similar kind of stories. Because if someone talks about finance, they will want to cover Debzilla. No joke, right? Someone talking about languages and learning and travel, they will want to cover Lillian's uh, stuff. So you just have to find people who are relevant. That's why it's people like, say, can, can I have your contacts? And I'm like, I don't think my contact will be your contact. You need to find the contact you need to have for your angle. 
because each of us will have a different angle with our game. That's very interesting. I never really imagined that the publishing industry actually have these rules in place. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for the insight on that. Actually, we do have a question for Yasmin and Denise. I think it's from one of your fans. Um, <laughs> she's someone who loves board games and she's learning the different mechanics behind it, like the trick taking, meeple placement, etc. And she was wondering, how do you begin with the creation of the game? Does it begin with you choosing the mechanic first? Or in the case of Bye Bye Virus, does it start with the story? From your experience, what would you actually recommend? So this will answer this question, but I want to show you just quickly what it looks like. So this is our first design. That was our wonderful dynamics of like the mechanics. And then we got fancier. We went to Canva. I know we actually did it on like a it was Microsoft, Microsoft Word. And then we had this, right? We got an image from Flaticon. And then we did it again, a different shape. And then eventually we, I hired someone on Fiverr and I got this done and we got it printed. So this will walk you through the dynamics. But the reason why we're showing this to you is because there's a lot of shit that you don't see. Like you're only seeing the final products, but I'm sure with all of our games, there is so much shit that you're not seeing. You're only seeing version number, whatever it is. So did you want to walk them through it? Yeah, for sure. Um, so obviously me and Yasmin, we are not really game designers. So we went it to, into it in a very um, like kind of a startup way where we go, okay, first, what was the objective of our game? So the first thing we did was, okay, we want it educational and we wanted it fun. So from there, we went on to who is the target segment of the game. So we were like, okay, we want to do it for kids. So because of the objective and target segment, um, we kind of have a generic view where, okay, the game has to be a level zero. It has to be easy to and uh, what we did was we went to do research on level zero games like uh, Denise, Denise, I think you should explain to them about level zero because not everyone will know the level zero games on board game geek yeah so I'm actually not very really that familiar I just know that level zero is like super easy to get uh, to play the mechanics are really easy so you have different levels for different types of games um, I'm sure like Steel's game is much higher level than our game um, because it's targeted at a different segment so I was we wanted it easy. So from there, we went to look at the competitors saying, okay, what are the really easy games that are really popular? And we used it as inspiration. So for example, you know, we looked at Sushi Go, we looked at Exploding Kittens, we looked at Guns and Robbers. So we took a few of the really, the games that we really liked and we mapped our education element into their game mechanics. So basically we said, okay, Sushi, sushi Go is a point system. So let us try to make this education thing with a point system. Exploding Kittens is a, you know, a cheating, a uh, stealing system, let's do that too. So basically we had, you know, version one, two, three, like I think we did six versions in the first one of um, <laughs> using different competitors and putting our educational element in there and we met it there and then we tested it out. Uh, and then we realized just because Sushi Go or Exploding Kittens is fun might not mean our version is fun because it was so boring the first time we had held a test. So we asked a lot of feedback on what was missing in these games. So we tested out six, we chose three um, game mechanics in the end, and then we tested them out. And then we asked friends, hey, why is this so fucking boring? Um, and then we had two main things we thought about. <laughs> how do we make it more fun? And how do we make it more educational? So some ideas that came out on how to make it more fun. We had friends who were like, what? You need something that fucks up the game. You need a card that allows people to stop people from winning. If not, it's too, it's too simple. Or you need people to, you need to add interactive elements like physical things like jumping jacks or stuff like that to make it more fun. If not, it's really boring as well. So we added a lot of elements based on feedback from our friends. Uh, and then the second part was after we made it fun and we can sit through it playing for like three hours, we're like, okay, now how do we make it ed educational? Because that was the main objective, right? Uh, and then we changed the design and some instructions to force people to remember stuff. So for example, part of our game is for you to remember <laughs> what protective items are for kids. And then we realized through the game, um, people were not remembering them. So we added a new card where you have to remember them. If not, you get your card stolen. So we did a lot of things to make it more educational. And then after it became fun and educational, the last thing we did was how do you make the game balanced? So, you know, in terms of the number of cards to make it make sure that everybody you know, the game doesn't end in five minutes or it doesn't take 40 minutes to, to, to end. And also how do we make it balanced for two to three people playing versus four to six people playing? So all these things, it just came out as we were playing the game that we didn't know about. And we just, you know, went step by step. Um, right. to fix it. And, and Denise could probably, should probably like write this for you and share this with you, the steps, so you have an idea. Um, but that's our way of doing that's it. That's our way. We didn't know how to do it. <laughs> All right. So I'm just going to take one more question from the audience. And this last question is actually open to the floor. Um, 
From your experiences, how would you see locally designed games differing from the other games around the world? Do Singaporean games have a certain flavour to them? What are your thoughts on the local design industry? Um, okay, I'm happy to answer because I'm a massive gamer. Um, I think it really depends on who your market is. So like games like Singapore Dreams are targeted very much, everyone knows this is for Singapore. Um, I think it's also like in terms of how much and how big your ambition is. Like I love the, the way that Lillian put it, like the what if and why not. And if you're just saying like, because initially we're not going to lie, Denise and I, our goal is to sell 100 decks. We're like, if it's 100 decks, we're awesome. And then we realized, actually, this is really fun. Like, what if we sell, sell more? And now we've sold 1,500 decks. And now we're realizing, what if we sell 10,000 decks? And what if we impact more lives? So I think it's just about realizing that the Singapore market isn't that big. So if you want to go beyond that, we have to look at other opportunities. And like, I already can hear from Lillian and Zoe that they're talking to Europe and, and the US. And that's because like, if your if your problem is big enough to what's happening contextually, like language or business or or hygiene, you can go at a different angle. But if you make a very local game, a hyper local game, then you got to realize that the market size conversion, it you got to know your numbers a little bit to understand. I'll take over for the local game. So uh, we created Singlish because you know um, there actually there was a guy from the panel you know uh, when we presented he was asking like hey I've been living in Singapore for a few years do you have Singlish card games and without a thought we created that and we realized that you know um, a lot of tourists or people who just settled in in Singapore which Singapore is like you know a hub for everyone you know from international to come here to visit or either to work you know and they would like to you know be close to what is the local culture is you see so they got a Singlish card card deck. And for the Singapore food card game, it's also the same kind of like uh, uh, thing. So we design in both thoughts of like, you know, local people and also people who come to visit Singapore or come to work in Singapore. The local people is the more of like, you know, hey, how much do you know about your Singapore food or like what to eat, you know, for lunch, you know, and they can make it as a game for that. And for the people from overseas, it's like, you know, oh, is Singapore food just chicken rice or, or chili crab, you see? But then <laughs> before or more than that kind of like dishes for that for people to discover. And thinking about like, you know, games for a longer run, uh, other languages like Cantonese, Hokkien, which actually has a lot of interest from overseas. Like, especially when I posted one of my posts in uh, subtle Cantonese traits, you know, it was crazy, you know, everyone from like, you can see like where the Cantonese are actually based in, in US, it's always in the West Coast or East Coast, New York or <laughs> Uh, California so they have a lot of big sales from there and also like uh, big cities in Europe like you know London you know Amsterdam is everywhere that is uh, Chinatown Can uh, Cantonese people will be there so that that is how we plan it and of, of course like you know uh, it's a good thing to design a game you know for fun or passion project or what you think but I think at the end of the day what is your you know end goal do you want to earn money from it or do you just want to have it like you know to showcase that you design a product and that's all mm. or okay. first okay. what it felt like after a while we are thinking the infinite mindset mindset where we think like okay for all the energy that we are putting in you know we need something a reward not just a reward of like you know being appearing on like you know social media and everything a reward is like you know monetary reward so that we can create more games you see yeah in future right. Thank you very much, panelists, I think, for the engaging conversation. And to our audience, thank you for all the excellent questions coming through. Um, don't worry, we'll try to address as much of the questions as we can post-event. Um, we hope that you have gleaned some useful tips for today's session. And if you would like to find out more about um, what is design as well as National Vending Gallery and ongoing exhibition at the National Design Center, please scan the respective QR codes on your screen now. And the National Vending Gallery is an experimental crossbreed of a design showcase, select shop, and automated retail. The National Vending Gallery supplies merchandise assembled into topics that reveal the manifold influence of design gripping our lives. So it is currently showcasing its maiden topic, Cardboard, which features 18 locally designed tabletop games, including the games designed by the speakers today. So it's really amazing how these um, logo designers are able to transform a ubiquitous material like cardboard 
to imaginative gameplays fit for social and experiential learning. So be sure to pop by National Design Center to experience the exhibit firsthand. We would like to hear your feedback on the session as well. So please help us with a quick post-event survey by scanning the leftmost QR code. The post-event survey link can also be found in the Zoom chat. If you would like to find out more about the programs the National Design Center has lined up under the theme of Singapore, our home, scan the QR code that you see on the right. With that said, we hope you enjoyed today's webinar. We would like to thank you for joining us this afternoon and our wonderful speakers and guests as well. Should you wish to revisit today's discussion, a summary of keynotes will be shared with you via email along with the relevant links on how you can find out more about our speakers and actually get in contact with them. So we hope you have found the session inspiring and meaningful and we hope to see you again at our subsequent events. Thank you for joining us today. We will be closing today's session and have a great week ahead, guys. Bye everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.